Hey everyone, it's me, Mr. David. Uh, due to the retreat, as well as this being a little bit of a longer lesson, I decided to film this lesson uh, and post it here on YouTube, and then as well as add puzzles. So as we go along, you can answer um, some questions as we go through this. Um, this is the last lesson of Unit 4. It's also the last lesson of the French Revolution. And so now it's time for us to examine uh, this next phase. Um, what exactly happens and it really all surrounds this one individual his name being uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and maybe you've heard of him before but what's gonna happen is he's gonna take over France for a period of time he's really gonna take over Europe and then there are gonna be some critical mistakes that are gonna lead to his downfall and then one of the big things we want to examine is okay in 1815 the French Revolution is over what is going to be the response from the rest of Europe. What's going to happen um, in order to respond to this? So, anyways, that's what we're we'll going through um, as we go through this. So, you know, be taking notes as we go through. Uh, you know, feel free to pause and do some other things. Um, it's going a little too fast, but try to go through the major points of Napoleon and and kind of what happens. All right, we're going to start this by looking at the military career of Napoleon because Napoleon is a military man, um, and by most accounts, he is a military genius. From the years 1795 to 1799, if you remember that directory is in control of the government, um, a corrupt institution but a stable body, in just those four years, Napoleon's military victories are going to be enough to rise him up into power. In school, although he's going to excel, Napoleon will largely be considered an outsider compared to most other students, kind of kept to himself, etc. Uh, but nonetheless, did well, knew what he was doing, learned a lot. His study of military tactics were very, very strong, and that's what he's going to devote his study to in the 1700s. When the revolution breaks out, Napoleon is eager to become involved and he is going to become a member of the army of this new government. Um, in October of 1795, he's a military general. There's going to be the royalists. Remember these groups that want the return of a monarch. Napoleon is going to successfully defend the government from these royalists. And so as he does, He's gaining fame. You know, people know, hey, this is a credible guy. This is somebody that's committed to the cause. In 1796, he's going to go further, and he's going to go outside of France and conquer areas in northern Italy. Uh, very impressive military victories, etc. What's most important to realize about whether or not it's his victories in northern Italy or his ability to defend the government from the royalists What's happening is he's becoming very famous, and people know who he is. They know he is kind of the top military general, and really, in this period, by about 1797, you know, he has become the most famous general in all of Europe. So again, not in charge by any means. He's just a military general involved with the new government, but again, somebody that's popular, somebody that people kind of trust and think uh, is doing a pretty good job and this is a picture of napoleon here um here by the way is napoleon and his army defending uh the government from the royalists and this by the way just shows you the military campaigns that napoleon was waging in northern italy it's with this notoriety and fame it's going to help him gain some power in france so um let's go back to what we talked about last class and how we ended things which is that after the terror people desire stability and with that being the case they're going to put into power a new government and that new government is the directory or at least that's the executive branch of this new government this directory certainly does uh, provide stability especially after the horror and the nightmare of the terror the problem is they are very very corrupt at first the people kind of accept it However, over time, um, they will lose the confidence of the people as the people realize this is not a government that's trying to help the revolution or better the lives of the French people. So this is obviously problematic. 
if you remember also the directory is only the executive branch of this government there's also a two house legislature what's going to happen is in 1799 napoleon is going to send troops to one house of the legislature in order to basically conquer it and then drive out its elected members at the same time the other house in this legislature knows basically their time is done they expect that if they hold on napoleon will just get rid of them as well so they're going to cast a vote and get rid of this directory and so at this point now we now have another different government in france um and what's going to happen is they are going to give power to three consuls. So these are the three people that are supposed to govern France. Uh, Napoleon is going to set himself up as the first consul of the French Republic, but over time, and it's not going to take very long, he is going to establish himself as the dictator of France and really be the sole person in control, being the sole person. So think about, again, this is only about 10 years into the revolution. We've gone from absolute monarchy at the beginning to that national assembly, to that legislative assembly, to the national convention. And then we have this directory. And now, 10 years later, we're basically going back to an absolute ruler. It's just a monarch. Powerful. Um, the way in which Napoleon sees his power is known as a coup, or a full-term coup d'etat. This is when somebody seizes power, usually in a military type uprising, and that's exactly what Napoleon does. Um, in other countries, especially in the 20th century, 1900s, and especially Latin America, where you see a lot of coups going on. And really the first time where we see a military general just taking power away, you know, through the use of force, through the use of troops, getting rid of the old government is known as a coup d'etat. And so if we ever talk about coups, its origins is going back to this moment. So again, a lot of origins of words, um, other political ideologies, you know, words, etc. coming out of this period. Um, we see here just a little bit better. And again, here we see Napoleon right here. Uh, we see the chaos ensuing in this legislature. But nonetheless, uh, Napoleon has taken enough kind of power to be in charge and to take control um and here by the way is a look at napoleon right when he takes power as first consul so that's what he is right now he's the first consul one of the things we're going to see is what napoleon is going to do is cement his power and grow it even bigger okay it's now time to talk about foreign threats against france and like we did before i'm just going to go this through this kind of briefly so you can see this a little bit better and kind of understand what's going on. Okay, as all this chaos and things like this are going on inside of France, France is still at war. And so what's going to happen is the British Navy is going to continue to attack the French, particularly on the water. So that's one threat that the French are dealing with at this point. Another threat is that basically some of the other powers in Europe are going to come together and they're going to form a second coalition. The first coalition is what we looked at last time, primarily with uh, Prussia and Austria before Napoleon. And the second coalition is going to be primarily comprised of Britain, Russia, and Austria, who are going to try to basically stop France and kind of end this madness. Um, again, what... France has ensued as chaos. There's rulers here that want to ensure uh, stability. They want to ensure that they continue to be absolute monarchs. And what's happening in France is particularly dangerous to them. Um, at this point, France is also going to move troops into northern Italy. And they're going to win. And so they're going to take over more territory than even before. Um, because of this... Basically, Austria and Russia are going to realize at this point that they really cannot continue fighting right now. They're going to need more power. They're going to need more support. And so they're going to agree to a peace for the time being with Napoleon, with France, etc. Um, even though there's going to be peace with these other powers, France still fighting against Britain. 
This will be resolved with a peace that's signed, which is known as the Peace of Amiens uh, with Britain. And what we see is that this kind of establishes overall peace in Europe. Um, for now, this is only about 1802, so this is just the first couple years of Napoleon's rule. There is peace in Europe, but there is still tension. There is still hostility that's going on, so we want to be kind of focused on that. Right here, by the way, is Napoleon signing these, this peace. Perhaps more important for us to look at as far as we've been looking at changes that are occurring during the French Revolution. One of the big things that we want to take some time to think about and, and look at is how France is going to change under this guy, Napoleon. And you can see from the title, he's going to establish himself as emperor. So... One of the first things we want to realize is that when Napoleon takes power in 1800, there will be a new constitution yet again in France. And this new constitution has Napoleon sharing power with him and his two original consuls. Remember, there was originally three that came together. And so at least for now, it looks like Napoleon is going to try to set up a nice rule, you know, this nice republic in France. Okay, here's what happens. Very shortly after this new constitution is passed, Napoleon gives a plebiscite to the French people. Now, what is a plebiscite? A plebiscite is when you basically give a vote to the people. And it's not a vote on a person. Instead, it's a vote on a singular issue. And it's basically a yes or no vote. So these still kind of exist today. So in 1800, again, right after this first constitution, Napoleon gives a plebiscite to the French people. And what he says is, hey, I'm a strong leader. Would you like me to be first consul? And the French people say yes. And so this initiative is passed very quickly. And so again, nothing too crazy um, that's going on here, but he, what he's done now is he established himself as first consul. So even though there's three, he is the top one. All right. Two years later, he is going to give another plebiscite to the French people. And this one is going to say, would you like me to be consul for life? Light work. Again, this will be passed very easily as well. Why is this stuff passed so easily? Well, again, what you want to realize is something that's been going on. Even though Napoleon, through this, is basically establishing himself as an absolute ruler, which means that all that stuff about freedom and liberty and equality is not necessarily going to be the case anymore. And this idea of separation of powers and, you know, um, the natural rights of people, you know, not necessarily there. Because of the terror and because of some of the other stuff that's gone on, people in France are saying enough is enough we are done with the chaos we are done with the madness um in 1804 he is going to make himself emperor and once again the french voters will agree and so again this is a, going back to this idea you know at least napoleon provides stability at least that looks better than what's been the case going on thus far it's pretty interesting the formality usually when someone is an emperor is that they are crowned emperor by the pope and so this is taking place in the notre dame cathedral in paris this beautiful cathedral the pope is waiting for napoleon he's got his crown and napoleon will actually take the crown away from the pope and place it on his own head symbolic basically trying to show hey look you are the church you are nothing to me all right i am in charge so this is really you know you you might have given you know the crowns to emperors in the past guess what not giving it to me i'm the one in charge and so again a, a kind of historic moment that goes on here but nonetheless a, a further sign of napoleon's absolute power again by crowning himself what he's doing is he's saying to the church i don't need you i can do this by myself um, here we see Napoleon, and here we see him taking pa the crown away, crowning himself, and again, we see him doing this as well. If you look at this picture kind of carefully, you can see some of the 
looks of some of the cardinals and the pope etc in the background i'm not sure they're so pleased but nonetheless at least for the french revolution napoleon provides stability and napoleon does provide order and so that's worthwhile to kind of think about as we go through this all right so again napoleon's got a lot on his plate here he needs to somehow figure out how am i going to restore order how am I going to make sure that everything is okay? So, um, what Napoleon does in order to establish order is to return to absolute rule. He is going to be essentially an absolute monarch here at this point. He's not going to really call it that, but what he is going to call what he has known as the French Empire. And what that shows, and what we're going to see very shortly, is that Napoleon is not going to be content with just being in charge of France. He's a military guy. He's a conqueror. He's been successful before. That's going to be the ultimate quest that he's going to move towards. However, with that being the case, even though he establishes absolute rule, he does work to maintain a lot of the big changes that the French Revolution enacted. So he does not make the mistake of trying to return back to Louis XIV. Instead, what he says is, hey, we can still maintain some of the good things that happened during the French Revolution. So, let's talk about that. Economically, Napoleon says the budget is out of whack. So, he's going to balance the budget, slow down inflation, slow down the high prices. He's also going to establish a national bank. This national bank is going to help give necessary loans, help do essential bank functions, and make sure it's aligned with what the government is looking for. What does this mean? Very simple. Bread. We know the people have been hungry. We know they haven't been able to afford bread for quite some time. Now, all of a sudden, bread is affordable. So again, these are the necessary changes that Napoleon puts into place to make things work. All right. Another thing, if you remember, there was this group of nobles, and we called them the emigres. And these were the very conservative group. They wanted a return to absolute monarchy, and most had fled France in order to go abroad. They didn't feel safe in France during the Revolution. Napoleon says, come back. Okay, we know you don't want to be abroad. We know you want to come back here. Don't worry. And basically what he's going to say is, hey, you, you're welcome here in France. Just don't try to overthrow me. All right, and obviously they're not nobles anymore. We've gotten rid of those privileges and things, but still, they do have money. They do have status, you know, so that doesn't necessarily go away. And so they're going to largely say, hey, you know what? We're in good shape. Another group that we want to think about is the middle class, the bourgeois. And we know that they were a huge part of this French Revolution. And we remember that they felt disrespected. They were... Uh, not able to hold some big jobs in French society because they were not nobles. And what Napoleon does in order to make them basically happy, he says, hey, look, you're going to have jobs and positions based on merit and performance as opposed to status, opposed to being a noble and things like that. And so this is another an, uh, initiative that makes people happy as well. So again, we can see restoring order, restoring a lot of the bad chaos that's been taking place. What is he going to do with the church? Well, again, we know that there's been an odd dynamic with the church and the revolution. Uh, the revolution has really labeled the church as an enemy. In order to kind of make things better, what he's going to do is he's going to say, hey, we are going to establish the Catholic church as the majority religion in France. Basically saying here, hey, most people practice catholicism and so even though you don't have to be necessarily only catholic this is the initiative that we should see this through however what the napoleon does say is that the government will continue to um appoint bishops and so they say look this is our way to make sure um we can you know have kind of a say but those bishops appoint the parish priests no government interference there so that's seen as being positive um, and so, again, because the church can appoint these priests, there's at least some freedom there. They don't have to necessarily do everything. Um, you know, the government, they don't have to be necessarily all involved. Um, what 
Napoleon does establish is that even though he says Catholicism is the majority religion, he does establish freedom of religion in France. And so what does this do? Well, this makes it so that groups like Protestants and Jews are at least tolerated in France. And so, again, even though Catholics have a favored position, they are in no way, you know, dominant or something like that where we have some odd arrangement um, and again, we that's really important. We remember that a lot of times the Protestants and the Jews, although a minority, held very high jobs. And so when you don't allow freedom of religion, that's a serious issue and that takes away a lot of your best people. What Napoleon also says to the church is, hey, look, we're going to help you out. We're going to put you in this favored position. You know, we're going to open back up the churches. If you remember that happened during the terror, they closed down all the churches. Boy, they're going to say here is, hey, look, you can't try to pursue church land that was taken away by the revolutionary government. You got to kind of leave that as is. Again, we'll open up the church, but the land that we've seized, that you had special status, that doesn't really belong to you anymore. And so, again, not like the churches going back to what it was in the pre-revolution, but it is getting some rights back. And so that's important. So again, we can see here, there are economic changes that are beneficial. There are social changes that are beneficial, religious changes that are beneficial. And so this is a good way that we're gonna move in kind of the right direction here. The biggest reform that Napoleon will make is actually in the category of legal reform. And so what does this basically mean? Napoleon establishes a set of laws known as the Napoleonic Code. And this is going to basically put the entirety of France under one specific law code. What is the overarching theme of this Napoleonic Code is that liberty and equality is still for all people. And that's so critical because if we remember, that was a big thing that the French Revolution had fought for. It was a big thing that they got in the early parts of the French Revolution with the, the very first constitution, with the Declaration of Rights of Man. And really, it had been in jeopardy since this point. And so now, all of a sudden, this is specifically saying, hey, there is going to be liberty and equality for all people. This also means equal rights for everyone. So it doesn't matter if you're a poor farmer, doesn't matter if you're rich and from a rich family, doesn't matter if you're educated, whatever, everyone is equal. And you have these rights like freedom of, you know, religion, uh, freedom of press, freedom of speech to some extent, but we'll talk about that in a sec. The reason why there's limited liberty as far as speech is concerned and freedom of the press is that the government does employ censorship. So this means basically, you know, if someone wants to publish something in the newspaper that's critical of Napoleon, that's critical of the government, the government's going to stop that from basically happening. But nonetheless, again, at least freedom of religion is kind of a good way to go here. Um, The downside for this is actually this will take rights away from women during some of the early parts of the revolution. Um, women had been granted rights like being able to hold property. Napoleon will actually take that right away from women through the Napoleonic Code. Another thing is that France still has some possession in the Americas, uh, primarily Haiti. And Napoleon's going to restore slavery in these French colonies. And so obviously that would be seen as bad. But overall this liberty and equality for all and this equal rights for people actually in France is going to be, you know, a critical part of this and something to kind of be considering here. Um, again, although the laws are equal for all, we put the asterisk there because there's one person that is not included in the laws and they are above the laws. And again, you could probably guess this, it's Napoleon. Um, Napoleon says, hey, look, I'm above the law. I am an emperor. I can, you know, do what I deal as being necessary and so again this is kind of going away from the enlightenment certainly in the sense that again a ruler can do whatever they want but nonetheless again there are some big changes that are happening and these ideas of liberty and equality that rallying cry of the french revolution at least at the beginning uh continues to be emphasized through this napoleonic code 
Um, again, a couple things that we've already said here. Again, no recognition of privileges, so everyone's equal at birth, freedom of religion, separation of church and state, occupation, one choice, and again, that big idea of equality, again, of all in the eyes of the law. All right, again, another big initiative of Napoleon is not only to expand his own power into uh, France itself, but outside of France. And so, again, we've kind of said this, um, he's going to take over Italy. And so, again, he's already taken over northern Italy. He's going to continue on that, basically take over it in its entirety. He's going to go to war with Great Britain. And this war establishes a stronger coalition of basically anti-French powers that are going to come together. Britain, Austria, Russia, Sweden, and Prussia. And they are committed to stopping France. Um, the reality is, though... Napoleon is not intimidated by this. And so what we see is that Napoleon will experience multiple land victories against Austria, against Russia, against Sweden, and against Prussia. And so that's relatively valuable. Um, this will lead to a huge expansion of territory. I'm going to show you it on the map, uh, but you're going to be able to see just how big France becomes in kind of the height of this. The one place that Napoleon has trouble taking over is Britain. And so he's going to go to battle with Britain in what is known as the Battle of Trafalgar. This is going to be a big sea battle. It's kind of a notorious sea battle throughout uh, world history. And the reality is this one loss for Napoleon is going to be more significant than all the land victories that Napoleon is able to um, accumulate. Um, again, what we're going to see is that Napoleon will lose to Britain in this. Um, it does kind of stop him, and his response is going to be uh, kind of uh, really kind of in a bad position and things like that. But again, that idea for Napoleon, the fact that the one place he wasn't able to take over was Britain is going to lead to him becoming relatively upset. Um, in addition to becoming upset about losing to Britain, he also becomes obsessed. How am I going to take over Britain? What am I going to do, you know, to make sure, you know, we're in a better spot? And unfortunately, that obsession is really going to be problematic. Um, this, by the way, is from this big naval victory. This is British. Um, the... Commander is a guy by the name of Nelson. Here we see some paintings of the Battle of Trafalgar. All right. Even though at this point he's lost to Britain, the reality is Napoleon has basically beaten everyone else. So what France establishes under Napoleon will be the biggest European empire since Rome. And again, Rome has not existed as an empire at this point for about 1600 years at its height. So this is a big deal, what he's been able to establish. You can see on the map here, this area in blue. These areas in blue are in some way, shape, or form ruled by Napoleon. And so you can see just how massive this is. Um, In order to make governance easier, he's going to do something that we saw also with some of our great empires. You have to establish how to maintain control. How, how are you going to govern? So what we're going to see is the lands directly next to France, Napoleon is going to completely take over. And what you can see from the map here, this is a little bit into Italy, um, as well as some parts in basically to the east of France. All right. Most of the area will be things that are considered to be independent, but in reality, they are controlled by France. This is places like Spain and German states. Um, why are they controlled by France? Napoleon establishes basically what we call puppet rulers to just do whatever he wants. The last group is the lands that we consider to be loosely aligned. And this is through alliances and things like that, that again, there's some connection between France and these other groups. Um, the reality is, again, as you can tell from this map, there's not a ton of places outside of Napoleon's control. Um, and so one of the things that he's going to want to do is to really try to secure more and more control over this entire area. And just so you can see this, at the largest point and kind of the peak of this empire, 
will exist from 1807 to 1812. But what we're going to see is that what's actually going to happen is that after this point and this desire and kind of this greed to take over more places is going to lead to Napoleon's demise. You can see the map here, so you can see this a little bit better. Again, the dark blue being the places directly under the control of France that we're directly next to. And then the lighter blue, these would be places that are either independent or controlled by France or somehow loosely aligned. Again, you can see this relatively better here. We see once again the dark purple. This is the French Empire. In the pink, we see the countries allied with Napoleon. So that would be that third category of loosely aligned. And again, what's interesting is these are the groups that are going to try to come and basically defeat Napoleon. They can't stand him. We see in light purple, these are countries controlled by Napoleon. So those are those puppet governments. And then again, the, the last places, which are in this uh, orange, primarily Portugal, Great Britain, those are going to be the countries at war with Napoleon. And they're going to work together with with those countries that are allied with Napoleon uh, to, to kind of get rid of Napoleon all the way together. But you can see just how big this gets in a short period of time. All right, so where would we be without talking about what actually leads to uh, the demise of Napoleon? And um, again, he's done well thus far, but that desire to conquer more places and that desire to get even more um, is going to lead to issues. So I'll kind of go through this uh, relatively quickly. There's three major problems that Napoleon is going to face. And so the first one is known as the Continental System. Okay, so let me explain this. Remember, Napoleon's upset that Britain was able to defeat him. And so what happens here is that Napoleon sets up what is called as the Continental System, which is basically designed to cut off all trade with Britain. And you can see on the map exactly how this looks. This red line is supposed to be all the areas that are not supposed to trade with Britain. And again, some of these areas are directly controlled by France, but some of these areas are just kind of areas that are loosely aligned or something like that. And so what he's trying to do is basically economically destroy Britain. And so in 1806, he tells all these places under his control, do not import any British goods. Do not buy anything from the British. It's over, you know, whatever. And so what he says, and or you know, is that this is the attempt to destroy the British economy. And so basically to make them weak, and so France would be able to take them over. All right. Seems like an okay idea. I mean, it's aggressive, but at the same time, if this is your goal, then, you know, I guess it makes sense. Here's the problem. The blockade is not tight enough. So smugglers from various places are going to break the blockade relatively easily. And so with that happening, all of a sudden now, um, the, the British are able to get their goods out and things like that. The other thing that we're going to see is that the British are going to respond with their own blockade uh, to kind of say, hey, look, uh, you know, you're going to do this to us. Uh, we're going to do this to you. And so what this means is that basically the British are going to start, um, you know, searching ships and taxing ships basically to go in. Um, this dynamic, by the way, with the British... Um, blockading and the British searching ships will actually lead to the War of 1812 with the United States. Uh, we don't really talk about it that much here, but the bigger thing that we do want to realize, very mild war, by the way, is that France has been unsuccessful with this system. Britain has been able to continue their trade. Um, if anything, the blockade that Britain puts on France is way worse than what we've seen before. What we also see is that the French economy is going to be weakened as well as a lot of their allies who were kind of reliant on British trade. So this attempt uh, to destroy them is going to be unsuccessful. And again, this shows us the areas that this continental system hoped to kind of get after. And again, this is all an attempt to basically weaken for, uh, Britain to completely kind of diminish their power. Uh, but again, as we can see, not successful. All right. The next place that we're going to see is Spain. And this is the decision by Napoleon to invade Spain. So let's talk about what happens here. 
Shortly after Napoleon tries to impose the continental system, what we see is that he will make a second costly mistake. And that is that he is going to try to place his brother, Joseph, as the king of Spain. When he does this, this causes a lot of anger within Spain, who basically think that he's just trying to establish, you know, puppet government, do whatever he wants, etc. So what's going to also happen here is, if you remember from the map, one of the only places not under French control is Portugal. So what Napoleon hopes to do is now that his brother is the king, he hopes to send French troops through Spain to go into Portugal and hopefully conquer them, basically. And so that's kind of the arrangement, and Napoleon says, hey, I should be in good shape to do this, set this up, etc. The Spanish upset at this whole situation. They do not want French soldiers marching through Spain. They also certainly are not pleased that, again, Napoleon's brother has been granted the king of Spain. So what we see is that, again, Napoleon's troops are no match for the Spanish. The Spanish army is way weak. But what's going to happen is peasant farmers in Spain are going to rise up against France. And we call this guerrilla campaign or guerrilla warfare. These troops are not organized like regular armies. Basically, what they do is they kind of hide, then they ambush the French uh, troops, and then they kind of go back into hiding and things like that. Although unconventional and things like that, the reality is um, they will be successful. The other reason why they're successful, by the way, is the British will send their own troops in here to help out the Spanish in this campaign against the French. Um... Even though Napoleon has this huge army and things like that, the reality is he is not able to fight back against the guerrillas. Because again, the way this guerrilla warfare works, these people hide out, they attack very quickly, ambush very quickly, and then all of a sudden, before you even know what's happened, they're already gone. And so again, this is not a good way for this to kind of move. This kind of war and fighting will go on for about five years between 1808 and 1813 leads to about 300,000 deaths of French men. And so this will really hurt the French empire. As this is going on, more and more are growing their hate in Napoleon and really seeing him as a conqueror and really seeing him as a bad, bad guy. And so again, we're going to start to see this rise of hate for Napoleon. Also, what's happening is that people are feeling more confident. Before this, Napoleon seemed unstoppable. Now, all of a sudden, you know, he's been defeated basically twice, both with this continental system that has not worked, as well as with this invasion of Spain into Portugal, which has not worked as well. This, by the way, kind of uh, shows what's going on with this guerrilla warfare um, against the French. You can see these are not conventional troops. These are just regular people, but they're able to uh, cause chaos. Um, this is a very, very simple uh, painting, but what this kind of shows is very, very simply guerrilla warfare. And we're going to talk about this type of warfare a little bit later, but again, usually uses civilians. You see the people hiding out and then basically ambushing groups. The last major mistake Napoleon makes is his decision to invade Russia, and this will really be the poor choice. Okay, so in 1812... Basically, what happens here is that Napoleon wants to conquer more land. And what is the better place to do that than Russia, which, again, is massive. Um, he thinks this will really, really be great. Um, this will this will lead to huge, you know, conquering, etc. Why does he justify doing this? Well, Russia was continuing to trade with Britain. And the leader of Russia at this point is Alexander I. And so he's, Napoleon says, hey, you know what? If you're going to continue to do this and we've already established this continental system, then we're going to invade. So when they invade in June of 1812, the French army is 400,000 men. All right. So again, large group, etc. Okay. And as they're coming in, the Russian troops know that once again, kind of going back to a similar trend, they are no match for the invading French, and they're no match for Napoleon, great military genius, etc. 
However, they're going to do a couple things that are going to give them an advantage. One thing that they're going to do is known as they're going to practice a policy of scorched earth. What scorched earth is, is that they are going to burn the ground as they're retreating. So you can think about this, but basically what this means is that as they're moving in and they're going on the defensive, they're burning all the land. So it means that once the French troops catch up to them, there's going to be no food on the ground for them to eat. And so this is actually a pretty good policy, and it leads to a lot of French troops being hungry and not being able to eat because of the fact the Russians are just going to burn off all this farmland in order to fight against this. As things get worse and, you know, as there is no food, French soldiers are going to desert from the army. And they're just going to leave. And they're going to say, you know what, I've had enough, you know, etc. So now all of a sudden that group of 400,000 is growing smaller. Uh, some from battles, but many from deaths of hunger as well as desertion as people just say, I can't keep up with this anymore. Finally, the French troops will reach the capital of Moscow. And so usually when you're invading a place, once you conquer the capital, that's when you've really conquered somewhere. So finally they arrive. However, the Russians do not want to surrender. So they already had burned their capital of Moscow. And so this is kind of a big insult to the French. And what it's basically saying is, hey, look, we'd rather destroy ourselves than be taken over by you. So it's very interesting what goes on here at this point. In addition, what's going to happen here is that they're going to try to basically make a peace offer between the sides, etc. That peace offer will never come. And all of a sudden, what's also going on is that by October, Napoleon is forced to retreat and go all the way back from Russia. Um, at this point, it's getting cold. The winter is going to set in. Um, and so more and more troops are dying and things like that. By the time they finally get out of Russia, there are only about 10,000 men left in this army. Again, remember, you can see it there. Originally, when they go in June, there's 400,000. But because of death, because of desertion, etc., now there's only about 10,000 left. So this is incredibly embarrassing for Napoleon. Um, this is obviously a really, really bad deal all the way through see here napoleon coming into russia again very cold the winter setting in we see this as well just so you can see this graph a little bit better so again we can see what's happening here um how many troops are just completely diminishing here at this point all right so now it's time to look at the defeat of napoleon so basically with all the momentum against napoleon these enemies that have already been trying to kind of take their realm here are going to say, you know what, enough is enough. It's time to take over. So we've seen, you know, these different coalitions. Now we see what's known as the Grand Alliance. And this is Prussia, this is Britain, this is Austria, this is Russia, and this is Sweden coming together and saying, let's take over. Uh, what we see here is that... Um, Napoleon is going to lose this battle of Leipzig. And again, one of the only reasons I say this is because really this is all of a sudden the, ch the, the change is happening. Right? Napoleon's losing battles that he had before. Another thing that we want to realize is Napoleon's empire is crumbling completely. And so again, this is obviously a problematic deal. All of a sudden these groups are fighting against Napoleon. There's not a lot he can do, etc. By April of 1814, the odds are stacked against him. Napoleon is forced to give up the emperorship. He's forced to surrender, etc. And what basically happens here is that these European powers are going to give Napoleon a small pension, so some money basically for retirement, and they're going to send him to this tiny island known as Elba. And they're going to say, hey, look, you're done. Okay, you're going to go away now. You've caused a lot of trouble. You caused a lot of issues. Now you go and, you know, we will clean up this mess, basically. So at this point, they think that he is gone. Okay, you can see here, by the way, where is Elba? Again, it's this little small island right here in the Mediterranean. What you might notice, though, is it's not too far away from France. Why is that significant? And by the way, this is Napoleon looking on from Elba. 
because Napoleon is going to try to return in less than a year's time. All right. So again, we've seen a lot of madness. Now the question becomes, what do we do with France? What What is going to go on? So what's decided is that um, there's going to be a new king. His name is going to be King Louis the 18th. So again, we've gone through quite a line here. Uh, this is the brother, by the way, of 16 because the son was killed. So the brother is the next one in line. The son was 17. Okay, so what do we see? In this period, again, less than a year, Napoleon is going to escape from Elba, come back to France. And as he comes back to France, actually many will welcome Napoleon back. And some will even volunteer for his army, saying, hey, you know, let's bring you back here. Let's, okay. Now, obviously, and again, many are going to volunteer for his army. What's going to happen here is this Grand Alliance says, oh my gosh, we just can't do this anymore. So they're going to combine all their armies together. They're going to say, we need to get rid of this guy once and for all. The final point for Napoleon's final defeat is at the Battle of Waterloo, kind of a famous-ish battle. But what's important to realize here is that this officially marks the defeat of Napoleon. Um, and now he's definitely in a spot that he is done with this. This period when Napoleon tried to come back, tried to raise this volunteer army and take back over France is known as the 100 Days. Well, with Napoleon's defeat of Waterloo, the 100 Days is now gone. What we also see is that this time, although he's sent to exile, he is not sent to exile so close. He's sent to another island, and I'm going to show you where this is, known as St. Helena, which is very, very far away. Um, he is going to live there in exile for about six years, and then he will die in 1821 from some type of issue, uh, stomach-related. Might have been cancer. There's some rumors that maybe he had been poison we're not entirely sure um however we can see just how kind of crazy his rule was and where france went from being the top power and you know napoleon looked to kind of restore order in france into where france has now basically been defeated napoleon is no longer and now we have to think about what's next and so again what is napoleon known for definitely a great general definitely a good government administrator absolutely um However, he's somebody that kind of we would think about in history as somebody that desires to go to war is going to lead to a lot of issues and a lot of problems. Um, here, by the way, is the Battle of Waterloo. And I just wanted to show you this to show you how far away St. Helena is from uh, France. And again, now that he's so far away, you know, the Grand Alliance and these powers have realized, look, uh, you know, he's not coming back anymore. Again, look at the difference in location between Elba and St. Helena. St. Helena really in the middle of nowhere. No way he's going to be able to come back to France. And once again, we see kind of this image of Napoleon looking out into the water. He lives very quietly. He lives alone. Etc. And again, we can see what's happened here. At one point, Napoleon ruled Europe. But now, all of a sudden... These battles have led to, and his desire for more has led to his demise. All right, so the last thing that we're going to talk about here is you've had this huge ruler who's done all this kind of stuff. Now, what are you going to do with Europe? How are you going to try to restore order? What are you going to do? So after Napoleon is gone, the great powers of Europe are going to come together. And it's only... Four of the great powers, it's Austria, it's Great Britain, it's Prussia, and it's Russia. The other great power is France. Um, you know, France isn't really attending this. The great powers, though, want to determine, obviously, the future of France, but more so the future of Europe. Before we get into a little bit more of the specifics, what we do want to realize is that the Congress of Vienna does lead to 40 years of peace in Europe. And after what they do, there will not be another war for about 40 years. And even that war is relatively minor. It's not that big, etc. How are they achieving these aims? They're going to achieve their aims and they're going to be able to be successful in this Congress of Vienna by working diplomatically, working through diplomacy and trying to kind of not go to war, not use troops or anything like that, but sit down and say, hey, look, 
How are we going to work this together? How are we going to make sure this is going to work itself out? And what is basically the major goal? And again, we're going to get into more specifically what they do. Return Europe to what it was before the French Revolution. Restore order. Get rid of this kind of chaotic time. What that means is a hope for stability. This hope that, again, you can stop the madness and you can stop the craziness. And again, as we've gone through this French Revolution, we really have seen the craziness. We've seen how insane this whole thing has gone. All right. The major person behind this Congress is known as Metternich. You see him there. But there is representation from all four of the powers. I mean, all four of the powers are coming in together and they're going to kind of try to get things working. The person, though, that really is navigating this is a guy by the name of Clemens von Metternich. Clemens von Metternich is from Austria. However, he is usually described as a European man because he doesn't see himself as being Austrian. He doesn't really see himself as working for the interests of Austria. Instead, he sees himself working for the better interests of Europe. And so what he devises in the Congress of Vienna is made for that. Because of how influential Metternich is in European affairs, sometimes we hear the period from about 1809 to 1848 referred to as the Age of Metternich. Metternich hated the French Revolution, basically thought it was a mistake, thought things were really, really bad, very conservative, did not want these big changes that were coming into play. Three major goals. One, strengthen the countries around France. Two, restore the balance of power. And then three, restore the royal families, uh, not only in France, but in other areas that have been taken away through this chaos of the French Revolution. So, if you remember in the terror, one of the things they wanted to do was erase all the aspects of the old regime in many aspects what metternich is trying to do is to erase the french revolution okay so we can see um, metternich and other representatives here at the congress of vienna okay so those were the goals that we looked at let's talk about how they're able to accomplish this so first off this congress meets for about nine months and they're going back and forth trying to figure things out etc Okay, first off, if you remember, one of the things they want to do is strengthen the countries around France. So this means basically encircling the French, making sure they are surrounded by stronger powers. Specifically, how do they do that? There's a kingdom next to France. It's been divided. They're going to unite it into one single kingdom, the Netherlands. Secondly, they're going to combine the 39 German states into a German confederation. So even though these states will still be kind of independent, they're closer aligned than they were before. They're also going to recognize Switzerland as being an independent and neutral country. So these are some of the things that they're doing to make sure France is surrounded by strong powers. All right, another thing that we're looking at is the balance of power. So how does that look? Um, they're going to have France give up the territory that Napoleon had taken over. Um, again, that was important and things like that. Another thing, though, is that even though they make France give up this territory, they are what we would refer to as being easy on France. And the reason why we say that is because they don't necessarily punish France really harshly. And that's important because it leaves France feeling okay once this is all done. Uh, the other thing is that for the victorious powers, the other great powers... There's going to be some rewards of land and things like that. And again, what you're trying to do is create a balance of power in Europe where all the powers are relatively evenly matched. And if you let France keep on to the territory Napoleon took over, that would not be the case. Finally, what we refer to as the last goal is known as legitimacy. And what legitimacy basically means is restoring the old rulers. So, for example, in France, they're going to say, hey, look, Louis XVIII, part of the Bourbon dynasty, you guys are back in control. Um, they're also going to put German princes, German rulers back into control as well uh, and be able to regain their throne. So what most of this is, is basically kind of returning back to the old royal powers and things of that nature. 
This Congress, by most parts, should be seen as a political triumph. And again, there's many reasons for that being the case. But what this does is it does basically restore order in Europe. What it also does is because there are no clear winners or no clear losers out of this, you are setting the stage where there is no seeds for future wars. We're going to get into this later, but sometimes if you punish a certain group and you see them as being an enemy or something like that, people get angry and people get upset. And so what you're doing here is you're saying, hey, look, no, we're, we're, not, we're not going to be so hard on France. This isn't necessarily their fault. We're going to make things kind of easy. And so that's what makes things really, really work out well. Um, however, for as much as they're going to be able to restore the old order, the reality is you cannot erase the revolution. You cannot pretend to people that this never happened. And so there's going to be new thoughts, new political philosophies that are going to emerge um, as a result of the revolution. And they're largely based on the thoughts that we had during the French Revolution. Um, this, by the way, just shows you a map of what Europe is going to look like before the Congress of Vienna in 1812, and then what it's going to look like after in 1815. And again, some big changes that are occurring, but you're obviously seeing that the French Empire is no longer, it's just France. You can see the Netherlands, it's right next to it. So again, trying to kind of um, be a power check to France, they can't necessarily just take it over so easily. Um, again, you can see this a little bit better. Um, in the little line, you see the boundary of the German Confederation. So we actually don't have a unified Germany yet. We have uh, the German Confederation, these German states. But later on, that will become one unified place. And by the way, we see some cartoons here. Again, these are some of the victors taking on some stuff during the Congress. And we see here, this is the idea of the Congress of Vienna setting up the power balance in Europe, trying to ensure that we have relatively equality throughout this. All right, so let's talk about the new political philosophies because what's going to happen here is that we remember that democracy is not really a thing in Europe. And before the French Revolution, it hadn't really existed. So the French Revolution is what we consider largely to be an experiment in democratic government. The reality is, by most accounts, the French Revolution failed. Obviously, the democracy did not exist very long, especially when Napoleon took over. But we shouldn't forget that it's going to set up new political ideas. So what are these? Well, conservatism. And again, we've talked about this before when we talked about the French Revolution, but now let's talk about it a little more specifically as it refers to all of Europe conservatives are going to say the french revolution was bad and it should have never happen what they're going to argue for is constitutional or absolute monarchy you need a strong ruler that's the only way this is going to work people are kind of crazy you know etc the groups that are primarily going to prefer conservatism are going to be primarily wealthier people that are going to say hey this is a good idea landowners you know uh, old nobility or you know new nobility stuff like that another group that we hear is the liberals and so who are the liberals they're going to say hey look we shouldn't be so quick to say the french revolution is bad because many of the early reforms of the french revolution were actually very good what they're going to say though is hey look the violence that accompanied the terror in other areas that was certainly bad okay you know that was not good but the early reforms and what was being strived for uh, was definitely noble and was definitely something we can consider. Liberals are going to support giving more power to elected parliaments and saying it really should be the parliaments that are able to have the majority of the power. Another thing is that the reality is most liberals are not fully democratic in the 1800s. And the reason why is because they don't want everyone to vote. They really only want people that are educated, that are landowners and things like that. You basically don't want kind of poor, uneducated people voting. That's what the liberals' viewpoints are. But these ideas of trying to, you know, declare rights, declare equality, should be seen as positive. Um, who's going to support this? It's going to be primarily the middle class. Um, so again, you know, educated people, people have some money, etc. The last group that we want to talk about are the radicals. And what are the radicals going to say? radicals are all about 
drastic change. And they say, you know, it doesn't have to happen, but if violence is necessary, then that's just the way things need to be. Um, they support democracy and they do not have voting requirements like the other groups. They say, hey, look, we need full-blown democracy here. They're going to argue that something like the terror that occurred in the French Revolution was necessary. And that was something that should have happened, needed to happen, etc. And so again, you can imagine kind of the horror of this whole deal. Um, and they also believe that, hey, look, we should look to spread the ideas of the revolution throughout Europe. You know, many people would gain from this, many people would benefit from this, etc. Um, who's going to support radicals? Working class people. Again, this would give them more power, more authority. We also see kind of intellectuals who are going to support this, students that are going to support this. But in the early 1800s, after the French Revolution, radicalism is not very well supported. And, and kind of the reason why, what you want to be looking at here, is all kind of the chaos that has ensued, you know, during the radical times. They're going to say, you know, let's kind of move away from this. Um, again, I've kind of shown you this before, but this is how you can see this. Again, typically on the left, we prescribe more change, etc. And then more on the right, we say, you know, less change and things. And that's exactly what comes out of the French Revolution. All right, so what we see is that conservatives are really going to be in control of Europe after the French Revolution. But that's going to look different in place to place. So let's talk about that. First off, we remember that the main group in the Congress of Vienna are the conservatives. And so what they do as far as restoring, you know, old absolute rulers, stability, etc., are largely based on conservative ideas. However, again, what that looks like is different. So for example, Britain will have a constitutional monarchy, a monarchy that is limited by law, limited by the parliament, etc., and it's going to be very very unique in that situation. What we also want to realize is that not only is the parliament powerful, the reality is the parliament is much more powerful than the king. Um, with that being said, again, we're still cautious to call Britain and true democracy because there are going to be restrictions to voting that occur there. Okay, another thing that we want to realize is that in Eastern Europe, it's going to be primarily absolute monarchies that are going to be in control so this is kind of the most conservative place um so much so that what we're going to see and this is what you see in the map prussia austria and russia are going to form the holy alliance and this is basically an alliance where they agree to help one another from revolution again they're trying to make sure that they're in a good spot and they are not going to be challenged in their absolute rule uh, France is going to have kind of a weird dynamic. Louis the 18th, obviously still the ruler, but they're also going to have what we refer to as a chamber of deputies, which is kind of like a parliament, basically. It's just not incredibly powerful. Um, parliament power, again, although existing, is going to be relatively low. Also, what we see is that very few in France can vote, actually less than Britain and their constitutional monarchy. The reality is, though, what's happened after the French Revolution is there is deep divisions in France, and there's different ideas, and there's those that are going to say to the conservatives, hey, we need to go more towards, you know, kind of having more absolute monarchy, things like that. That's how we're going to make sure there's not, you know, total chaos. And then on the alternate side of things, you have those that say, hey, we need to continue the French Revolution and things like that. So anyways, this kind of ends it up. I hope you enjoyed this, gave you some knowledge. Again, feel free to go back and kind of make sure you have your understanding here. But we've really seen this French Revolution go in a wide variety of places. Talk to you soon.